horrendous 7-1 rally by the Blue Jays en route to a 9-4 Toronto win that ended the Red Sox winning streak. And again, and I say winning streak, this streak of good play, and because they, it hasn't been a totally pure winning streak. They did lose a game in Cincinnati over the weekend. Uh, they're going to still have a chance to win the series with the Blue Jays tonight at Fenway Park. But this, uh, to me, gets into the issue of the bigger picture with the Red Sox and also, you know, where they're going in the bigger picture and, you know, just what they are. Okay, what they are as an organization. Brian Bayo got shellacked last night. I'm, I'm trying to find the box score because I want to give you the exact numbers. So give me one second. Was it a seven-run third inning? Or okay, it was. It was a seven-run yeah. third inning. So were the third innings, I think. They seven, were booting the ball all over the infield. There were there were yeah. errors during the inning, and so I don't want to. And there were some plays that weren't errors that that were, you know, potential plays that could have been made defensively. For example, there was a ground ball to the left of Emmanuel Valdez. He didn't get it. Could have been a double play. It would have been a tough turn because he's going to his left, and he sort of slid. But nonetheless, a skilled second baseman yeah. makes that play, and you have a shot at a double play. You need an out on that play. You need at least one. Yeah. Instead, they got none. The floodgates opened. Toronto ends up scoring seven runs in the inning, culminating with that ball that Guerrero blasted off the center field wall. Do you think some of those errors correlated to how Bayo looked afterwards, too? Yes, so yeah. this is what I'm getting I'm at. I'm glad, yeah. Bayo is mentally brittle. Yep. I think that's clear. I thought last night proved that. So you know what happened? He caved. Mm -hmm. He caved in. Okay, and again, that's sort of an old baseball term, but we use it in sports for everything, that when the pitcher finds some adversity, he caves. That's what Bayo did. He caved. That's how a manager would describe it. That's how an executive would describe it in the game. He caved. He collapsed. He got frustrated by the fact that his defense let him down, and he completely imploded Paul. In fact, it probably happened to you when you were on the mound. Well, I, I, it's funny that you say that. I, <laughs> I have, maybe once or twice, I have a, a saying I always say, any, anybody can pitch well when they have their stuff. Bingo. I say it all the time. You know, it's what you do when you can't locate your pitches and you can't quite execute the way you want to do. Do you find a way to go six innings and give up three runs and give your team a chance to win? Or do you give up seven in the third inning like, like Bayo did last night because... Valdez didn't make a play that, let's face it, should have been made. Wasn't all that difficult of a play. I didn't like the way you went after that either. Um, but I I have concerns about Bale. Wasn't it like two starts ago he like rifled his glove off the mound yes. after he gave up a dinger? Yes. Yeah, he, like, he collapsed. And you, you're laughing because you know me well enough <laughs> to know what I was like when I pitched. <laughs> like, believe me, anybody that watched me pitch knew exactly what was going on with me. Because my emotions were right there for everybody to see. But I never threw my glove. <laughs> like, I never just completely collapsed like that, you know? But that pa was evident Polly, last Polly was a lefty at BU, in case you didn't know that, Murray. Back when they had a baseball program yeah. at BU, yeah. which shows you how long ago it was. But this kid, so... Well, it, it was evident that, look, it, he had sucky defense behind him last night. But you shouldn't unravel the way that he did. He, no. It was like he just said, oh, the hell with it. And I'm this gonna is like, you know, half a season now. He hasn't pitched very well this year. And I know, like, he's got some wins. His ERA is still over five, right? Well over five. It's now five point five five. Yeah, like I, he I, walked more batters than he struck out last night. He had three walks in two and a third innings. He gave up five hits, a home run. He's been serving up home runs all year long. When the perception is he's supposed to be their ace, right? So yes. Murray, and this is the part that I'm worried about. And so, and again, this speaks. This is a reflection on the organization now, and I'll tell you why. They gave him a contract. They gave him a contract. Yeah. This is one of the guys that they identified and said, yeah. well, you know, we'll sign him early. He's important to us. We're going to give him six years and $50 million or $55 million or whatever the hell the number is, and I'll, I'll, I'll look it up again. But this is a guy that we deem to be a long-term investment. And he is going out there, and when someone makes a mistake... He implodes. Or if it's daytime, don't forget that, too. He really can't pitch good when they, <laughs> they have daytime yeah, starts. That was a big thing last year. Yeah. I remember that down the stretch. It's one of the reasons why I'm not as, as excited as I probably should be by this recent spike in, in performance. I, I, I thought the Phillies and Yankees series, to me, were like, hey, like they hadn't really beaten a team with a winning record Correct. all year. Those are their first wins in a series, I believe over teams with winning yeah. records all season. Against two of the top three teams in baseball. And you were like, hey, is there something going on? But I, I would be more excited about it if 
the reason for the winning was more about like Brian Bayo, Tristan Cassis, who's been out for a while, and some of the younger guys that you think will be part. Now, maybe Duran's in that. I don't know. What's he, 27, 28? 27 or 28. All right. So, I'll, you know, I'll count Duran as maybe one of those. He's been eh. great. He's been great, but he's played really well. You have to admit that. No, no, he's played well, but he's 28. Yeah, like I, I just look at it as those are the guys that I want to see be the nucleus when the rest of these prospects come up, and that's something to get excited about. Tanner Houck, to me, is something to be excited about. I think, yeah, I know I've heard you talk about this a lot because, you know, I get stuck listening to your, your little baseball show on the way home. No, but like, he's got first round pick with that kind of talent, that kind of ability. And, and it's coming together for him. That's something to get excited about. I wish there was more of this success that was due to that than like David Hamilton having an out-of-body experience for three weeks because I don't think he's that good of a player. Well, sure. So, again, and, Paul, that gets into the big picture. And what I'm saying is if you look at Bayo and look at Houck, okay, they're, they're similar cases in that they're guys that came up in your organization, had some hype surrounding them. Houck was a first-round pick. Bayo was an international free agent. Bayo's younger. But they identified Bayo and said, we're going to sign him. They haven't signed Houck yet. And yet Houck is pitching his ass off, is a candidate for the Cy Young Award, Maybe they offered him the kind of deal that they offered Bayo, and he said no. He said that's not enough because, frankly, it's not. Yeah, it's a low number. So Bayo signed for six and fifty-five. I just looked it up. The fact that he accepted it worried me because the deal is clearly team friendly. Okay, here's my point. That's a guy that realizes he kind of sucks. Or he doesn't. <laughs> have the, I'm, I'm he, getting the money now. <laughs> right, he doesn't have the mental toughness yeah. to be able to to bet on himself. So, and this is what I'm getting at. Where are the analytics for the mental toughness of Brian Bayo? Well, that's not quantifiable, Maz. Okay, so so now uh, did they, you know, when they went to Hauk and they tried to offer Hauk a contract, I think, and he said no. Now he's going out and pitching like a Cy Young Award winner. So now the price for Hauk is I know going exactly up. exactly what you're talking about. Absolutely. So, so the point is Hauk is a tougher sign. And they either misevaluated or lowballed him. In other words, the guy they signed now can't hack it. The guy they didn't sign is ripping it up. And the price goes up by the day on Hulk. Yeah, no, this is the thing. And so, and the other guy they signed, Murray, just to finish the thought, and I'm sorry, um, is is um, Ra- Raffaella. Of course Raffaella took the money. He projects to be a utility guy. I mean, maybe he'll turn into an everyday player, and he's hit better of late, got the average up to about 250. But there's still nothing to suggest that Raphael is going to be some sort of elite, everyday offensive player. Maybe he will be. Maybe they'll be right on that one. I'll allow for that. But you see what I'm saying? The two guys they signed are really the two guys who took the money. Yeah. Two guys who probably have agents are like, get this, sign this now. Holy crap. No, because Tony, you might yeah. not be that good. Yeah, Tony's right. point on Bayo, I think, is really interesting because we've seen in sports a lot of times guys will roll the dice and bet on themselves. And it takes a certain mentality to do that and you're seeing on the field the performance with Bayo is showing that maybe he doesn't have that kind of mental toughness to separate the contract to the performance and maybe he just looked at as that's the first option I had I'm going to jump at this and take it not necessarily because he doesn't know if he's good enough or how much better he is but I don't want to worry about that I just want to get this done Rather than gambling on himself and potentially making more money if he put in a Tanner Houck kind of season. And if that's what happens, so it solidifies my theory that a lot of these nerdy front offices, which the Red Sox certainly have, have iced out a lot of the real baseball people. And Alex Cora is a real baseball guy, baseball lifer. So guys like that get put on the pay no mind list because we're going to go, we're going to look at our data to make our determinations on whether or not yeah. we're going to give a contract to a player. And so someone like Cora or a real baseball guy who's been around the game probably looks at Bayo and says, this kid turns into a puddle. You'd be crazy to extend him. Right. But there's an I, intangible there with Mar- with him, Mar- yeah, right? Baby. Yeah. So, so yeah. So it goes. So, yeah. yeah. He's a baby. It goes bad for him. He turns into a puddle. So so the point is, you can look at Bayo and say, well, he throws 96. He's got great movement. He's got a good changeup. He's 24 years old. He's got the ba- uh, He's got the um, build enough of a build. He's not built like Hulk, but he's got enough of a build. You can look at him and say his. And there are metrics for all of it: velocity, movement. Size, no metrics for balls and heart. Though. Age, so they can look at all that and say, "Well, he projects to be something like Marcus Stroman, who is worth twenty-five million dollars a year. If we sign him now for six and fifty-five, 
we get unbelievable value. Let's lock him up now. Let's get him at that number. But there's nothing in there that says the kid doesn't have the maturity to withstand some sort of mistake. Don't make an error. In the yeah. field right now. Right. There's nothing that shows that. Jimmy, the, the comment, Jimmy Stewart, the comment we have on um, that Cora made about Bayo after the end, because Murray, you said a second ago, Cora's an old school baseball guy who can evaluate. Okay? Here's what Cora said after the game about Bayo. Two walks, but I'm in a bad spot. We we gotta we gotta throw more strikes. That's the most important thing, you know. Regardless of the results, that summer summarize he's out. You know, we gotta throw more strikes. I don't need to hear anything more than two walks put him in a bad start. Aw, get out of it. Sack no. up and get out of it. See, I, I actually think Tony's on. I think Cora was being critical of Bayo last night. You can point to the play that wasn't made behind him and fluff it off. Like, well, you got to make that play. That's a play that ninety nine out of a hundred big league second baseman make that play's got to be made you don't have to walk two guys that's on you you know what Cora, that's not on the defense yeah. that's on you so first of all Cora's tone the, the cut was 14 seconds Cora's pissed and if you saw him walk to the mountain last night he was pissed he was already on the phone he looked out to the bullpen oh, yeah, stuck that. his yeah, hand yeah. up yep. like it was one of these like just you know, i had the same reason had, yeah. his, had his head down. he was pissed like this kid can't hack it he's all over the place something goes wrong and he implodes he loses his composure core is pissed okay and the whole cut was 14 seconds and and paul is right you know what when you uh, the manager looks at him and goes no 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 i don't care about the mistake at second base you have to be accountable for what you did wrong. Core is trying to teach him accountability. That's what he's trying to teach him. Don't blame the second baseman. You put the runners on in the first place. And you're not throwing enough strikes. Like, it is so frustrating. And again, to me, Bayo is emblematic and part of the problem with this approach. I guess that's what I'm getting at. He's the guy they picked. He's the guy they picked. He gets into a tough spot, and he implodes. So, How come they haven't signed Hauk yet? But this could be a different argument, too. Like, did they pick him because they thought he was better, or did they pick him because he fit the suit? He took the, he took the, the deal because the it's, a, it's a terrific deal from the Red Like, when the Red Sox signed, when this deal came, it was spring training, right? Yes. I, I mean, as a Red Sox guy, I, I was like, that's a great contract. Six and 55, that's great. So I don't have any problem with the Red Sox. They they got a, a very team friendly deal. I think it's a good deal for that. Even if he ends up being this, like it's not not going to kill you. It's not Chris Sale. No, no, no. It's not a killer. It won't hurt the franchise. You know. But it's just like I I don't know necessarily. But is he they good? Identified him because they thought he was better. Is he good? No, I don't know. I think that's out. That's the jury's out. The last pitcher that got a deal like this, Garrett Whitlock. How's that one turning out? Can he hack it physically? No. So, again, like there, there are drawbacks. So the guys who can pitch and last cost money. <gasps> they cost money. They can't have that. And Tanner Houck didn't take the cheese. This kid did. Now we know why he did, I think. But because I walked away from that last night saying, this kid's a baby and he sucks. <laughs> he, he lacks a composure. <laughs> yeah. He's... Right? He just doesn't have the maturity. If you like that clip, check out more videos from Felger and Maz here. For more Red Sox analysis and opinion, hit this playlist. And for all the latest from the Sports Hub, download the app at 985thesportshub.com.